Political leaders in the line of fire. Can state-sponsored murder ever be justified? We'll ask why targeted killings are becoming more common and find out why they often backfire. This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Lauren Taylor. Is Israel out to kill the leaders of Hamas? An Israeli minister has said senior Hamas figures, including the Palestinian Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh, are legitimate targets for assassination. Among them could be Khalid Mishal, the leader of Hamas. He's been a target before. In 1997, Israeli agents attacked him in Jordan, injecting poison into his ear. But the agents were caught. They were released only when Israel handed over the antidote and 20 Palestinian prisoners. Among them was Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the founder and spiritual leader of Hamas. But seven years later, the quadriplegic was assassinated in an Israeli airstrike while leaving a mosque. Well, joining us now are our guests in Beirut, Alistair Crook, a former security advisor to the EU. In London, Richard Belfield, an author who's written extensively about political assassinations. And Zahir Jan Mohammed from Amnesty International is in Washington. Uh, Alistair Crook, if I could go to you first of all, is this threat uh, from Israel uh, against, uh, against the Hamas leaders real? Is that a real threat or is it grandstanding, do you think? I think it's probably grandstanding in this case. But as you rightly pointed out, assassinations have been used in the past. And I suspect that if the rockets continue and if there are deaths in Israel, it may turn into a real threat. Uh, Zahir Jan Mohammed, uh, how worried are you by this kind of a threat? Um, I'm actually quite worried by it. I think what's happening is a slow erosion of international human rights law. And I think that extrajudicial killings is increasingly being used by states um, as a method um, in, in these conflicts. Um, and I think that there's increasing justification of that in the name of security, which is all very distressing. Okay, well, let's uh, have a look. State-sponsored assassinations are nothing new. They've littered political history ever since Roman times. Julius Caesar was famously stabbed to death in 44 BCE by senators alarmed at his popularity. Similar killings have gripped the public imagination ever since. The Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky was murdered with an ice pick by a Stalinist agent while in exile in 1940. Bulgarian writer and dissident Yorgi Markov was assassinated in London in 1978 with poison apparently fired from an umbrella. Bulgaria's communist leaders, helped by the KGB, are believed to have ordered the killing. Syrian agents have been named a suspect in the murder of former Lebanese Premier Rafik Hariri, a claim Syria rejects. And the former US President John F. Kennedy is among many high-profile figures whose murders have provoked theories about state involvement. Uh, if I could come to you, uh, Mr. Belfield, is there more of a willingness nowadays, do you think, uh, to go out there and uh, hunt down people and, and, and kill them in this way? I think um, assassination has always been a tool of political uh, governments throughout, the, throughout the, the history, as you say. I think what's much more worrying now is that in the past, governments tended to be more discreet about it and more secretive, whereas now uh, governments, particularly like Israel or the United States, are quite open about using it as a political tool, and that's very worrying um, for, the, for the whole state of the body politic internationally. What's the tipping point, though? At what point does a government suddenly think, right, this person has to be assassinated? I don't know. I think it's often just frustration and a mistaken belief that somehow if you take out a single person, uh, all your problems are going to be solved. But historically, this just isn't the case. Um, if you look back at the, uh, is, um, the Islamic fundamentalists who killed President Sadat in Egypt, they're still no further towards achieving their aims now than they ever were you know, back in the 1970s. Uh, as to Crook, you've sort of uh, witnessed all this kind of stuff over the years. How does it actually work? I mean, what's the process where a government starts up the machinery to, to, to end up at the point where someone is killed? Well, they build up a bank of targets. They choose those targets according to criteria laid down by the government. They might be political or they may be military. But it, it, the interesting thing is the effect of this on the morality of the state and the corrosiveness of it. For example, you get into the questions of how many innocent people can be killed. And in Israel, they actually set up a committee with a mathematician to work out how many innocents could be killed in a targeted assassination and came out with a figure of 3.14 or more if it should be a children as the acceptable loss of life of innocent victims in committing an assassination. And I think it brings in a whole 
uh, field of other sort of calculations, uh, apart from the one of the psychology and what it does to people and what it does to the people who are committing these acts and what it achieves. And I think one of the things it's, uh, uh, the last speaker just said, which is very clear from my direct experience, is that it's not been effective. It is actually been counterproductive. And so I think the pursuit of it now is very much because it's become an ideology. It's become a tenet of belief, contrary to all the evidence, that this is somehow an effective tool. I think it largely reflects the bankruptcy of our thinking about what to do about the challenges that are facing the West at this time. If I can bring in Zahir John Mohammed, is uh, part of the problem in some cases governments are more or less open about this. Uh, what do you do about the fact that a state can quite easily deny being involved in, in an assassination? Um, well, I think that the, the key thing is that a lot of states, are, in fact, are not denying their, their involvement um, in these. I think there's sort of a Wild West sense of justice. You see this very much with the Bush administration, um, maintaining the right to bypass the international community and to basically do whatever it wants. I think in the case in which the state does deny, I think there is oftentimes irrefutable evidence um, of um, uh, political assassinations by the state. And I think that one of the things that's important is for the international community to up to hold these states responsible, including the United States. And I think what's happening is a general climate in which these actions are condoned. And I think, what, as the previous speaker said, it just triggers a whole uh, system in which you know, violence is being seen as a recourse uh, to address political grievances by both the state and by non-state actors. Okay, well, let's uh, take a look at the moment uh, briefly at the American experience. In 1976, uh, President Ford signed executive order 11905 banning assassinations. Uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal, uh, there was considerable concern about CIA covert operations. Then in 1981, President Reagan reinforced the ban, signing Executive Order 12333. This states, no persons employed by or acting on behalf of the United States government shall engage in or conspire to engage in assassination. However, before the September the 11th attacks, the Terrorist Elimination Act was introduced to Congress, which proposed aggressive anti-terrorist measures. It was never passed, but following the attacks, President George Bush managed to ease restrictions on military and CIA missions to kill Osama bin Laden. Um, do you think, uh, if I can bring you in, Mr. Belfield, do you think uh, that, uh, that there, there are sort of rather extravagant methods have been used in the past, uh, and now things are slightly more obvious? Um, I mean, in the past, of course, traditionally, assassination was done either with a knife or with poison, and then obviously guns come in. Um, the technology now is much more sophisticated. So, for example, in the case of uh, the assassination of the al-Qaeda leader uh, al-Harithi in Yemen, the um, Americans fired a rocket from a, re uh, um, a remotely operated drone which homed in on the mobile phone signal of one of the passengers in the car and destroyed him and everybody else in the car as well. So methods are becoming much more sophisticated, um, which is also much more worrying because, of course, it means that um, there is now a kind of uh, a, a, um, a two-class system, which is that the advanced nations can use these extremely sophisticated methodologies. You know, the uh, Russia is using uh, used them against in, in Chechnya. Uh, whereby uh, anybody carrying a mobile phone is extremely vulnerable to be to be taken out with a missile. Um, Alistair Crook, are there any rules at all in this uh, particular area? There don't appear to be any. I mean, it's essentially just a new word for an old vice, uh, the old vice being the murder of your political opponents, and that's what it um, uh, amounts to. But I think what is clear, and the change is not only the technology, but the way in which the ideology of the West has reconfigured the world into the civilized us and the barbarian them. And if they're outside of the boundaries of civilization, uh, then anything can go. Anything goes. They don't seem to believe that there are international laws or norms of behavior because these people are not part of the civilization. They're beyond it. So these methods and techniques are used to those people that are seen to be outside of civilization. But of course, in a sense, it becomes self-fulfilling because we should not be surprised if we use unrestrained actions of this sort against those that we classified as uncivilized, the barbarians of the world, they might actually start using those techniques themselves 
in response. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that these groups then do become, if you like, uh, the threats and the barbarians that we first cast them in. Zahir Jan Mohammed, is that your um, experience? And how difficult is it as, a, as an organization like, like yours to try and make people accountable for the kind of actions they're taking? Well, I think one of the, the, the things that human rights groups have is that we try to hold states and non-state actors accountable to international law. I think there is an abundance of rules that do apply to this circumstance. I think, as you mentioned, many states, including the United States, have rules against political assassinations. But I think what is seen right now is that those rules are pliable, particularly when it comes to you know, fighting the so-called war on terror. So for us, in terms of uh, one of our, our mechanisms is to try to use these laws against these states. But what we're in finding increasingly is that these states, like the United States government, is saying that these rules do not apply, that when it's fighting terror, that it can do anything and will do anything. And I think what happens is that that creates an overall climate in which you know, our criticisms are met by, well, we're justifying the, you know, uh, an al-Qaeda leader, we're justifying some Hamas leader. It's really about the concept here. It's about extrajudicial killing, and it's about the state basically bullying people into, uh, in, into whatever, whatever it wants. It's the it's state intimidation. Okay, well, uh, the British government has announced uh, just today that it's seeking to extradite a former KGB agent suspected of being involved in the murder of another Soviet-era spy. Alexander Litvinenko fell critically ill after meeting two men in a London hotel. After his death, high levels of the radioactive agent polonium-210 were found in his body. One of the men he met was Andrei Lugovoy. The British authorities now want him in court to face charges of deliberately poisoning Litvinenko. Litvinenko had been a fierce critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin and from his deathbed accused Moscow of ordering his assassination. Putin dismissed the claim as ridiculous. Nevertheless, last July, the Russian parliament approved a new law which formally permits the killing of people seen as extremists living abroad. Well, we're going to take a quick break now, but when we come back, we'll look at cases where assassinations have backfired on the regime that ordered the killing. So do all of you stay with us.